On this week's episode of No Filter, I had such a wonderful talk with Femi Kuti that I asked him to stay longer. The musician, the activist, the man of compassion, the voice of Nigeria. Please enjoy this special episode and bonus episode of No Filter with Femi Kuti. Enjoy. Let's start from the beginning, like we always say here on No Filter. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to remember, where did we first meet, Femi? Wow, the shrine. Oh, no, yeah, no, the shrine. I, I thought it was the shrine, but I'm thinking... I it was somewhere in France. There was a, probably a, there was a um, fashion show somewhere in France, and you were there. Really? I think so, in a castle, somewhere like a castle somewhere in France. In I Versailles? might be wrong. Something, yeah, I think so. My God, but that's very, like many moons ago. Very, yes, very, very long time ago. You know, what, do, do you think it was for designer John Galliano, Christian Dior? I can't remember who it was for, but I, I mean, I've done probably wow. a thousand shows after wow. that. Oh my God. <laughs> You, so you, I've got to look that up now because you really took me there. Um, what I remember is when I got to hug you was in 2018 when you were about to start your rehearsal for the Nelson Mandela 100, the Global Citizen event in St. Johannesburg. Oh, okay. Yes, that's very clear. That's very clear. That that's one's clear. clear. And yes, um, clear. you were so... And the next time was at this right. <laughs> yeah. And you were just so calm. And you took, you said to me, you just was like, you just calmed me. Because I was a producer <laughs> on that show. And I was, yes. you know, we had some hiccups and, and we had a fatality also. So it was a lot going on. And um, you just calmed me right down and just really just this great, amazing energy of peace. Thank you. <laughs> so Femi, let's start. And uh, what, I mean, tell me about where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in England, 1962. I was brought back to Nigeria, Lagos, immediately in 63. And I've been in Lagos all my life. And what was it like growing up in Lagos? Wow. Very peaceful at the beginning. It was, um, we didn't have, you know, when you come to Nigeria now, you see all these huge fences. Then yes. there were nothing. We used to sleep with our doors open. It was very safe. Security was, there was really no need for security. Mm -hmm. People left their doors wide open. We had no fences, no barbed wire, uh, no traffic. And after the civil war, everything just changed. Things started to get very hard and tough. Mm -hmm. uh, Nigeria got oil, corruption started massively. My father had his first, first heat in 71. It became very popular, it became very political. The first raid came in 73, and it was it was a nightmare after that till and we're now, how facing many, how many brothers and sisters, excuse me, sorry, Femi. How many brothers yes. and sisters do you have? We're seven in number. From my mother, three. Um, for, unfortunately, my younger sister passed in two months after my father in 1977. So you're, so you're now six? Yes. Six. And I mean, growing up being the son of fellow Kuti, who was just this huge symbol, I mean, he basically put like Nigeria Lagos on the map for many people. I mean, many people got to know about it more through his music. How was that growing up? Was that, was, was there some great, I mean, there must've been some incredible moments. You just must've had so many creative people around you. Ah, uh, yes. Um, there's nothing like my father's music. So of course we had that growing up, different places he played, he performed. And then it depends on which side you are on. If you're on the side of the people, he was loved with a passion. If you are on the side of the government, he was disliked or envied. And so it, it depends 
where you found yourself. The taxi drivers will probably take you around for free because they knew you were a last child or the fare will be very cheap. I mean, you got into a bus going to school. Oh, fellas, son is on the bus. Oh, don't take, you probably will not ask for money. And you go to the bourgeoisie side. And if you had a girlfriend or boyfriend, my sisters, and they found out you were a fellas child, oh, they didn't want anything. They didn't want their children to have anything to do with fellas children. Okay. So, no, of course not. Um, uh, that would so, so not do- be that way right now. Trust. Uh, <laughs> so it really depends and then my father said to tour so we had a very different view of the world how and then of course 1977 first act stevie wonder was in nigeria all these great american bands came from um, america all over africa he was extremely popular he was he never seemed to be mainstream but all the mainstream artists James Brown, everybody knew about his music. Miles Davis knew him. So everybody, everybody when they came through, they came like, they yes. that. Yes, they have, I mean, he 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 walked out of the first act and the government was annoyed because all the artists who came from outside Nigeria to perform, after their performance were at the shrine or at the Kalakuta. So this really annoyed <laughs> the government. <laughs> it's, do you feel that so you, you, Bella Kuti was a people's person. Yes, you don't, do you don't, do you, do you, So you, you do not feel that the government understood what a national treasure and export that they had? Did they understand? I think they did, but there was too much invested interest in corruption and greed. And it was hard for them to compromise. It's still very hard for them to compromise their bad character with doing what is right for the people Mm -hmm. and don't forget a lot of african governments protect america and europe's interest and so we still have this colonial umbrella over our heads so this invested interest they have they must be seen to be protecting this interest. So of course, people like my father stopped, people like Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, people like um, Patrice Lumumba. So anybody who was Pan-Africanist was stopped. Most yeah. recently, Thomas Sankara. And so my May father I was- ask you, did you feel yes. safe as a child? Never, ne- never. Uh, well, you see, as a child, you don't really think about this, but my mother and my maternal grandmother, my mother's mother. And your were mother on... was also someone of a yes. activist too, correct? No, my grandmother. Your my grandmother, ma- your father's yes, mother. But, yes, but my mother was involved, but nobody knew about her. She was, I mean, she was more about protecting her children. And my mother's mother, so I stayed more with my mother at the beginning and my maternal grandmother. And they were always like, very scared for us because they always felt the government could get to us to get to fella and there was always a car i remember we used to stay somewhere in Suleri called ikate and there was always this car packed from 7 a.m to like 7 p.m every day and this two guys would be just reading this paper and my mother would always say look they're the sss they're the SSS. be careful please but you know as children you don't think you want to go and play football you want to go out with your friends you want to go to party so it was just growing. When I become late in my teens, I said to realize, wow, we have been living kind of very dangerously. It's like a movie. And when you start to read books like Malcolm X or Patrice Lumumba or Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, or then you start to see, wow, fellas, life is no different. We are in danger every day of our lives. And so it starts getting very tricky or, or scary. Right. So did they take any precautions to protect you and your siblings? Fela was very stubborn, so nobody really thought about security like that. My mother would just say, please be very careful, be very careful. And before she's finished talking, we're out of the door. As kids um, do, as kids do. Yes, you you really don't think about, I mean, 12, 11, 13, 14, you're not thinking about security in that sense. It's even, it's latter, in my latter life, I said to think that, wow, so this family really hated me because I was Fela's son. And then it starts to hurt you that, wow, 
You mean this happened because I was fellas son? Oh, I wasn't given a chance because I was fellas son. Oh, I was mm. loved here and a, a smile comes. I mean, teachers even picked on you because you were fellas children. I mean, we had fights because a lot of the rich kids who are pro government or yeah. didn't like my father because probably their parents didn't like my father. They brought this fight to school. So we had, I had daily fights in school as well. So you, and oh, it was gosh. later that I started to realize the gravity or, oh, should I, it's not gravity, the uh, probably the problem of being fellas child as well. Now, you just mel mentioned Malcolm X. As well. And yes. when did you realize, Femi, that your father, Fela Kuti, was a legend? When did you realize I, that he was something special? He was different. <laughs> I always, I don't know, but I, from probably when I was, um, uh, frankly, totally, um, I would say I was 15, 16, 17, between there. And it was just so obvious. And he, I don't think he probably realized how huge he was. And I just always felt that because I wasn't. Till this being, very um, day. I wasn't. I wasn't being, it wasn't because he was my father, but we listened to everything. We love Michael Jackson. We love James Brown. We love Bob Marley. But there was just something about his music and probably because we were living what he was singing. So yes, we'll go to the parties, but we always had to come back to Fela's music. And it just um, seemed, it touched us in a different way. And it wasn't just comments from me, my friends, um, his fans, he had a very solid fan base here. And I, Peter Tosh came to Nigeria. And then Tosh. I said to say, wow, it's very important in um, outside Nigeria. And then we said to tour. And the international press paid so much attention to him. And I was saying, wow, he's greater than we perceive here. And everybody seemed to know him. And France, everybody. but he just he always had this very casual life, okay, and just took things normal. I said, Yeah, as, right. a true artist, <laughs> as a true artist, he was, he just was moving on to the next. Let me ask you so, what age did you decide in your life, having been around music growing up, that you yourself wanted to be in music? I always knew I wanted to be in music, it was just how, when. Now you have to understand, I never went through the conventional way of learning. I really taught myself 95, 96% of everything I knew. Mm. So my father just put the trumpet in my hand, go and play. I had no teacher. Put the sax in my, go and fight, teach yourself. And I found a way. His band leader taught me for two weeks. My mother was very angry because she wanted me to get the best education like his father gave him. So she wanted me, wanted me to go to England. He said, no, he didn't want me to go under a colonial structure. Then I should go to Ghana. My mother was very against me going to Ghana. So I ended up going nowhere. Well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I ended up joining his band as a kind of apprentice. And Roy S came to Nigeria. And yeah, he came. Really can you play the sax yet? I said, yes, I can play. Okay, play this. Pada, pa, pada, pada, pada. That was the tune Roy S and my father played on the album Africa Center of the World. And so he taught me that tune and I joined the band after that in 79. So I played with the band and he said to give me song after song. I was, mm. then his fan base just jumped on me. Hey, you are great, you are that, blah, blah. And I got carried away. And when he was illegally stopped in 84, and I moved back to my mother. And it was my maternal grandmother that brought me back to earth because I was so arrogant, fella son. I was quite a lousy saxophonist, but everybody <laughs> kept saying, that mess, you know. But tell me something, playing the sax is a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of like throat and diaphragm. How do you hold that air? I mean, God, I tried to blow one once. I felt like my ears were gonna pop. Well, you need good lungs. You need, you need to be physically strong. But then the breath circulation is a technique where you store the air in your cheek and under your chin. And whilst you are breathing, you release the air simultaneously at the same time. So you are breathing 
as you're putting the air out, you're taking a deep breath as well. Then you store the air. So when you run out of breath, you let that air out again. You say, I knew this a long time ago. I knew this in, my father taught me or showed me the technique, but he could never do the technique. So he just told me about technique. Get straw, put it in water, blah, 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 and oh, I can't do it. And he just, he, because he, he never, he could never do it. So one day I tried it on my own and oh, I, and I got the technique. So I put it on my sacks, but it was nothing. So one day we went to a friend's house and Kenny G was doing it. And I said, oh, I can't do this. And everybody just looked at me like, what? Stop boasting here, shut your mouth. If you could do it, why have you not? All these years we have never heard you do it. So as soon as we get home, my elder sister, you know her, Yeni, comes, Yeni. you are boasting. You could do this technique. Oh yeah, sure. So I did, he said, wow, you really can do it. And you never do it on stage. Are you crazy? And I said, well, the way Fela taught me was, you are not supposed to show off. You are supposed to be a musician, blah, blah, blah. I said, no, you must do this. So this is how I said, <laughs> make sure I do performance. So now, grandmother <laughs> brought you back to earth. So yes. then when did you start to do like your own recordings and to start to go out on your own? What age was that? I, I was, um, wow, this was, I think my first song I wrote was probably in 1980 or 81. I recorded this, but my father never released it. So I had about, I used to open up for him when he went on tour uh, and at the shrine. I had- Now, can enough, we just explain had, quickly, because we've mentioned the shrine a few times and yeah. I feel like just, I want everyone to understand how special this shrine is. The shrine has moved about four times. Oh, has it? So it's not the one where? Yes. I, oh, it doesn't matter where it no. goes. For me, it's the soul. So with my father, it was a place called Kakadu. It was known. It was the, It wasn't really the shrine. Then it went to a place called Empire. No, Surilere nightclub. Mm -hmm. Then it went to Empire. Empire was the famous where it became really famous. Mm -hmm. And it was when it was at Empire. Empire was like just. A second, two seconds, it was opposite the Kalakuta. So this was the shrine, and opposite it was the Empire Hotel, where my father called the shrine. Okay. Now, Kalakuta was now burnt by the soldiers. And so my father was stopped from playing at the Empire. Empire was at the backyard, kind of, at the, the soldiers' barracks, called the Abati barracks. So mm -hmm. they came from that barracks to burn the shrine. So my father was stopped from this line. Yes, they, they no, they burnt the Kalakuta. So he was stopped from playing at the shrine. He now moved to Crossroads, a hotel, and decided to perform there. And then he was stopped there. He moved to Ghana, and then he was kicked out of Ghana. And then he now built the shrine at Ikeja. Unfortunately, he is thought- I, Which is he, the one I've been to. No, this is not the no. one you know. No. This is not the one you know. This was taken over, taken from us because the owners, he thought he bought the land. You, you trick to selling this land and you're telling him it's not so. He had this big case. The law says when the person dies, he, the family can't continue that fight. So we lost the case. So we went to the family, Benite family, begged them and they refused to sell the land, which probably was a good thing because when no, we license it's back. I just think that's just awful though that you just say it so casually oh. that how the troops just of oh, this will put him out of the places that he was just playing music. All this time was when you have to again remember when the house was burnt, he was a multi-millionaire. I mean fella was stinking rich and they bled him. He became so poor he couldn't put food on the table anymore. I mean he was that poor. And I moved back to Kalakuta with my father now. So I said to stay with my father. So I witnessed firsthand poverty again under a different, because he was so rich. And so, and it was like starting all over again. So I was part of that new episode life. in his life. Thank yes, and um, so when they, it was- Do you know why, what, it, what is it that they wanted from your father, to him to just not play music anymore? To not I think make it was too, people it, joy? He was too, he was too, he, he was too at home. So Bob Marley, who was political in a way, yeah. He was far away. So the radios would play Bob Marley. The government would support Bob Marley. I was James ask Brown. You about that. Did they ever oh, meet? 
No, they never did. He met Peter Tosh, but not Bob Marley. And, you know, he, again, you have to remember this time. It was always the recording companies versus the artists. For some reason, there was this, you could even say healthy competition between musicians. Not like mm -hmm. now you could just call, let's have a co pro collaboration. It was yeah, more protecting. It seems, like, it seems like you had them, you had the, okay, you had the music the recording companies, but it also seems like you had, your father had to deal with also his own government, which was not in yes. support of him. And well, I, don't forget, Bob Bali too had to deal with the government in Jamaica, Jamaica as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. I mean, but probably, I mean, he was shot at as well. Bob Marley was shot at until he moved out of, and I think he moved to England or America. I'm not very sure where he moved. I think he lived the in Germany, is, he lived in England. Fella, you know fella that just, I worked with Bob Marley, right? I didn't really know when that. When I was in 1977. Yeah, Kalakuta was born. Now you know, now, I never hide my age, but I was not, I was seven years old when I worked with him. What sounds so similar in what you're saying is jumping to here we are now. Your father yes. is a legend, fellow. <clears throat> There's nothing anyone can take and do about that. That's what he is. He is inspired and it's re-inspiring a whole sound and bringing up afro beats in a new way correct yes so with what and how he was treated then or he and him being a person of the people what do you feel with what's happening now like is there a similarity of controlling the people ah yes it's but very strange very strange because my father's time was the military. You really, they were, they were in their uniforms. And when they changed, the civilians came, then the military came back. And then the civilians came, then the military came back. And, but we could always identify who was who. Mm -hmm. With this new democratic process, at the beginning, it was the military who changed to being civilians. Many of them became retired generals or whatever their ranks were, they became senators and they became one, General Olusha Mwabasujo became the head of state, the president mm -hmm. of Nigeria, and he had two terms. So already for me, I saw this as being a kind of trick. It was just, they just changed the channel, but same actors, same people, and it's been like that since. And they have managed to, they have managed to, I don't know if fool the audience, if that's the right word. The difference now is in Fela's time, Fela was the lone voice all through the 70s and midway in the 80s when some human oh, yeah. rights activists joined. I think there were about mm -hmm. maybe four or five. My father's brother, Chief Ganifa Wemi, Fala No, and maybe mm -hmm. one or two others. But they was they were on very contradictory sides. My father was totally against Abiola and they were pro Abiola because of the elections. My father was completely against Abiola. So but everyone the has the right to their own opinion. Yes. So but Fela was very against Abiola because he believed Abiola was working for the CIA. Now and he had a song about this. So he could never see eye to eye with them. They were just they I were mean, like democracy so it sounds so yeah. similar, sorry to cut you, but it sounds so similar to what almost Billie Holiday went through in the United States, where yes. she wasn't allowed yes. to sing certain songs. Yes. You yes. know, Strange yes. Fruit. Yes, yes. I mean, all that, um, you can really relate with Billie Holiday, mm -hmm. Miles Davis, you know, there are times when musicians could not come why to through the front door. Culture? Why the question is, why to our culture did you want to uh, stop? the joy of them and their artistry. Because of, well, you I have mean, to understand. What was it that they were afraid of? You ask yourself uh, that question. Because the African empire was so powerful. You have to understand, we had empires all over Africa. And when the Europeans came and the Arabs came, it was basically to take our resources and enslave us. And they distorted history. They made out and pretended we sold ourselves. They made out and they distorted the history 
and nobody wants to go back to that history. And when we go back to that history, the history tells us negative things about ourselves. Now, to revisit that history truthfully means Europe and America will have to apologize every day of their lives. They are not ready uh -huh. to do that. Very few people are ready to accept this history. The torment, the torture, I mean, the cries that went on this continent, the atrocities committed on this continent and to the black race is really truthfully unforgivable. And they are afraid yes. if this topic came up sincerely, it probably will, it will bring violence or um, I don't know what they're really afraid of, but the, that truth is something they are very scared of. It's like the truth of the Red Indians in America. Nobody yeah. wants to bring that topic up. No, it's, but there's, there's the fact is, that before the the Columbus and everybody America. came to America, uh, it was they met some people there, and yeah. these people were erased from the face of the earth, and they brought Africans to do the dirty job for them and build <laughs> America. But this history, Americans don't want to really go into. They don't want to delve into this history because it's it's. But it's, I feel um, now it more brings, than ever, it, it leaves a very bad taste. I feel like now yes. more than ever, a lot of people in America really want to know about their ancestry more than ever before. In the last four years, I'm not saying, I'm just saying I've seen it more, I've heard it and seen it more and more and more that people really, maybe it's because of who they elected, they just want to just know where they come from and they want to go there and they want to see it for themselves. Um, I think generally, globally, people just want to live in peace and harmony. In Nigeria that's, now. Well, that's, really we have, what, that's what we're we, all looking for at the end of the day, isn't yes. it? Yes. Like I was saying, in Nigeria, we have a very vibrant youth. In my father's time, the youth were too afraid to talk or confront. So it was just my father's lone voice. Now you have a lot of young people talking out, even if they're just typing on the internet, they're mm -hmm. still voicing that's their, their concerns. Voice. Exactly. With the new music that's out today, would you call this because your father in Fela Kuti invented Afrobeats, correct? Yes. So this is would the would you say the Afrobeats that's out now is the second time around? Or third? <laughs> Fourth? It's not Afrobeats. It's Afrobeats. And what they I think they're just very inspired by my father's character and his music. Uh -huh. and they try to emulate. But then when you listen to my father's music, the horns, those horns, the rhythm, the articulation of the melody and all these things, the Apple Beats is very far from what he was doing. What they have taken is some elements, maybe drum patterns, and they try to be more pop oriented. So it's very different, but this, um, you cannot deny the fact that they're inspired by the Afrobeats and they needed so something to identify. So I understand. Afrobeats, A-F-R-O-B-E-A-T-S, right? And then you yes. said, and yes. then the Afrobeats is with a Z at the end? No, Afrobeats is my father's. Mm -hmm. There is no S. Then the Afrobeats no is, there is the one with the S is now what is more the young new, people... re new, new rendition. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, I am more Afrobeats. My son is more Afrobeats. So it's Afrobeat is very complex because you can't be very similar. Every song has to be different. Mm -hmm. You, you ask me a question where you're going to make me be very critical musically because I will have to be very critical because for the integrity of what my father stands for and for future generations. Now, my father was a trained musician. I'm trained, I'm self-trained. My son is trained. And the difference is we compose, we arrange, we write everything. Mm -hmm. Most of what people do is they buy the songs, they collaborate a lot. So it's, it's I, I like it. It's very party, it's partyish. Mm -hmm. So I, I really like it. But you can't compare what they're doing 
with a strict fella, Anikola Kukuti, who, when he was writing his music, music, there was no time for fun and games, really. Especially when he was... Okay. Yes, especially when he was, when he now became confrontation, confrontational, and music was his world. Like I said, his articulation of the rhythm, of the melody, of the chord progression, of the horns, the brass section, mm -hmm. the lyrics. I mean, there was nothing like Fela. So the Afro beats in that respect are very far. But you can see a very young generation who are inspired by this great icon. You can see they respect him a lot. And we do, as, as his children or fans, have to appreciate that they love him and they like him and all that. And so really, you put me in a very tough spot because you will make me say things I don't want to say. I reserve to myself. I tell very close friends. <laughs> because when you understand Africa, you see a lot of these young people have been deprived. They are not, they, they, they become superstars, but they are youth. They were very deprived in a sense again to get instruments, to teach themselves musical instruments was probably impossible for them. So they use a lot of computer. Their music is very computer oriented. And Afrobeat is very far from being, you have to be a seasoned musician, so to say. You have to show dexterity, improvisation. You see, Afrobeat is very, very serious music. Where did you, where do you think your father Fellow Kuti, the icon, the legend, the one and only, got his strength from. Because when I look at the documentary of our great friend Steve Handel's Finding Fella, I feel that your grandmother was very much the strength. Was she? She was, but his father was very strong. It's just that his father was more at the background. You have to understand, his father motivated his mother as well. His father taught his mother how to drive a car. His father encouraged his mother to be, to drive that car. Why shouldn't my wife drive? Why should she, hey, stop that, hey, um, where are you all getting this? A woman can't do this. So he was really, he was at the back, but he was, he gave her a lot of courage. No, not courage. He gave her a lot of support, moral support. And he defended her, that why should my wife not be able to do this? So, so when was she was leading the protest. Was it time for a man to support a woman in doing all these things that women were not supposed to do? Uh, in their eyes? Don't forget, don't forget colonization brought this Christian way of life where the male factor was seen to be, must be dominant and oppressive to the female. This is mm -hmm. not, again, an African culture. You have to understand the African culture, a woman could rise to become a king. Women headed institutions on, on the continent of Africa. So this oppressive, when you are all this feminism, for somebody like me, it's very hard to understand because from my home, and I think even my father probably diverted away from the true essence of African culture. The woman's place was never in the kitchen. The woman was really, truthfully, when you look at the African home, she was head of the house. She brought up the kids. She cooked. The maid. She, she, oh, that's what. She, she, we, without her, there was no home. So, but she Amen. allowed the male to say, yes, it's my house, out of respect, because you can't let your husband feel inferior. Even in my, my house. I mean, I, I, I grew up with my mother, my sisters. I was seen as a protector. Mm -hmm. I defended my sisters, my mother. But I knew without them, I was nothing. Like I give you, all, it was my maternal grandmother that brought me to the level. I don't do anything without my sister. That is the typical African home. Without the female support, you are you are, you are really you really have a long way to go. How how do you disrespect your mother or your sister? And if you have a respect for your mother or your sister, Listen, Yenny, then you marry a woman. Yenny, well, when you I see the way I relate shrine, with my. When I came to the shrine. You were but you were done. And I was like, I can't believe we came all this way. And we were she so brought me back good. down. And Yenny <laughs> brought you right. She's like, hold on, Naomi, don't worry. He's going to come back. I'm like, no, they said he's finished. 
She's like, nah. Yenny bought you right back. I was just Yenny, like, she I don't do I hardly do anything at the shrine. Everybody gives me credit. Yes, it was me that was physically there to build and all that. But she right now she manages the shrine. I only show up when some people start to think because she's female, they have the right to be aggressive to her. Then you see her army. She's a warrior and she has soldiers like me that will come out and say, Hey, are you crazy? <laughs> because she's a woman, how dare you? So that is the African culture. And so I think whether we like it or not, for most African men, maybe very few these days, it's still in our DNA. Right. We do respect. So this, when I hear people bring the woman down, it's very, it's, it's very painful because yeah. this is not in our DNA. And yeah. I cannot imagine, you think you're going to marry my daughter, I are going to be aggressive because you are male. Ah, uh, the way I bring up my daughters, they, uh, no. So you see, my daughters, they are already very, um, they are already in charge That's of the strong. house. Oh, you see, my daughters, even to me, their father. <laughs> when they say, when they come, everyone's hey, so okay, we, are, we apologize. I love no argument. I had such joy that day being with you. Such joy. So, so do you feel? Business. I mean. They always say. So my, um, back to my grandfather. He was always there. He encouraged her to lead the protest. He encouraged he her to go. I'm rest. sure they were having, um, when they, are, they were alone in the room. Sorry. Yeah. That because don't like forget, colonization had just ended. We were just entering. Um, we were just coming out of slavery. We were, I mean, Africa had changed. Africa had changed drastically. But so, yes, my, my father saw his mother as very a, a warrior but he did get a lot he was very proud and he told us several times about even how his father flogged a white missionary who came to inspect his school and he was very proud. he said he'll never forget that day when this white missionary came and his father said how dare you come and inspect my school out out and he flogged him out of his <laughs> school so his father was like that but he was a missionary so you see he still had to be very conservative he still had to be holy but secretly, I think you could see all the, the DNA of a true African guy. Your new album coming out? Have we got new tunes coming from you soon? Yes. I have a joint album with my son coming out pretty soon. Wait, so I'm looking son, forward to that. Please tell us about your son because I put up on my social media about your son. He is extremely talented. Yes. He's, uh, <laughs> he's um, a father I couldn't wish for more. He's, um, he's, he's beautiful. And he, really is. he has a single and video called Free Your Mind. And it's, uh, he plays all the instruments. He did all the recording. And he worked with the same producer that produced my father, Sodi and me. So it's, um, it's like a big family. But he's so talented that it's incredible. I mean, he's, he's so, he's, he's a joy. And he really is. I, as a father, I just, if this is his first step, I mean, I can't imagine what he's going to be doing in the future, the great future in front. He has a very great future in front of him. I hope he does, I hope he maintains the way energy he has put on. I think so. In it's instilled. That's, that's instilled. He has that so same I, peace, that same. Peace. That's just no. I, th I, I think he's is is a is a definitely a more beautiful person than I am. Is is um so. But that's what a father wants. When you see your child, and you sense and know your child is more beautiful than you, I always tell people I'm going to die with a smile, and they can't understand why I talk like that. But I mean, when you see your children and how beautiful they are, what 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 greater joy can you have in this life? So I, w I will live this life very peacefully and I will be you very have happy. incredible kids, incredible. I love them. <laughs> You've seen I, all of them. I've got the they pleasure are, of coming to your home are, and don't the tell characters them, but, are just incredible. Don't tell the them. Personalities. But, don't tell them. 
I, I, I shout at them a lot, but they are beautifully <laughs> You know what, can I tell you something? <laughs> you shout at them when you need, when you want to be like, to put a little discipline, but it's got, you always have a smile on your face. How can they take okay. it seriously? That's the problem, I, no, yeah, yes, they are really <laughs> shout at them because they went to school, they left their books in school, they did this, they left, I, what's wrong with you? You know, but you <laughs> see, children will always Listen. be children, but at the end of the day, they are beautiful. <laughs> Wow, you sound, I mean, your story, I could listen to you yes. for hours. It's just, and <laughs> just, it's like such a blessing knowing you because it's just, as I said, you are such a symbol of peace and tranquility to me. And I thank you so much, Femi. <laughs> I thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming on No Filter. I love you so much and thank you. Mwah. Naomi, we all love you here too. <laughs> be I'll be strong. there very soon. Yeah. Very soon. Thank you so much for watching this week's bonus episode of No Filter. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you all for watching. Mwah.